the Buddha was a very earnest teacher. He saw there was a real problem in life, the suffering. Everybody suffering. There's one point where he says he had a vision of the world before his awakening. It was a puddle drying up when there were fish in the puddle, lots of fish in the puddle, and they were struggling with one another to get what little bit of water was left in the puddle. But the water was going to dry out, dry out, dry out, and here they were struggling with one another. It gave rise to a real sense of dismay. But then he realized that the problem wasn't out there, the problem was in here. He said it was an arrow buried in the heart. Once that arrow could be removed, then there would be no more, no more suffering. The arrow was clinging, craving, all the factors that give rise to suffering. And it takes a full-blown effort to pull that arrow out. It's not something you do lightly, something that you do in your spare time. It's got to take top priority in your life. Even after his awakening, he said he saw the world as being on fire. He had been experiencing the bliss of release for seven weeks. Then came back to consider the world, and he saw all the beings of the world on fire with the fevers of passion, aversion, and delusion. So the goal of his teaching was to help people put out those fires. It's an image that recurs again and again in his teaching. He says you want to practice as if your head or your turban, he said, was on fire. So you don't wait around. You can say, I'll do it when it's convenient, or I'll do it when I'm in the mood. The fact is, uh, your head is on fire right now, and it's burning right now. So you've got to do what you can to put it out. So that's the kind of teaching the Buddha gave. That's the kind of teacher he was. He was very earnest in everything he said. I was reading today about the concept of irony in romantic poetry. We don't tend to think of the romantics as being ironic. They seem all very sincere, throwing themselves onto the infinity of nature, soaking up the infinity. But one of the thinkers said that it's because they'd had a sense of the infinite, and they'd also seen how inadequate their poems were to express the infinite, that they were always in an ironic relationship with their art. They felt they had to create art as the best way of expressing the infinite to one another, but they always had a sense it was totally inadequate. And you see, see that in some teachers nowadays. They talk about the infinite, and then they look at what they've got, and it's all pretty inadequate. I remember reading about a teacher who said there were, she would go through periods when she wondered if all this Buddhism business was just a bunch of crock. There's no truth to it at all. She wrote this down in a book, and then people praised her for being honest. Without thinking here, what she was making money off of selling something that she really didn't know if it was good or not. That's not the kind of teacher the Buddha was. He was earnest. He knew they had found something that really worked. He wasn't trying to express the infinite. He was focusing on the fact that there is a problem. There is suffering, and there's something you can do about it. And if you don't do anything about it, you're just going to keep on suffering. 
So you've got to keep your priorities straight, what's really important in life. And it's very easy for us to distract ourselves with other issues, to busy ourselves with other activities. And forget the fact that our heads are still on fire. And there's nobody else who's going to put the fire out. It's not going to go out on its own. Passion, aversion, and delusion have a way of feeding on one another. Unlike the fires of the earth, this one never seems to run out of fuel. It's up to you to pull the fuel away, to put the fires out. The image in the canon is a fire is just constantly feeding. The word upadana for clinging also means to take sustenance. And the main images in the Buddha's teaching for clinging focus on this element of feeding. On the one hand, there's the clinging in the, in the image of the field of karma. Every plant that grows in the field of your karma that comes from the seed of consciousness and is watered by your clinging and craving is feeding off of that water. And it's feeding off of the soil of your actions. As for fire, it feeds too. It feeds off of its fuel and it clings to its fuel at the same time. So you have to look at where you're feeding. And ask yourself, is it really worth it? We tend to think of feeding as a good thing. We're hungry and then we find something to feed on and that ends our hunger. But look at the food of the world. Does it really end your hunger? It assuages it for a while, and then you're hungry again. And some of the things we feed on actually make us more hungry. That's how they design a lot of junk food. It get, gets compulsive. You keep feeding and feeding, and for some reason you just feel more and more hungry the more you feed. And if the food itself doesn't make you hungrier. Then they wrap it up in all kinds of advertising to make you eat more. Like those little chocolates that come in and wrappers it. Tell yourself to indulge yourself. Take a moment for yourself, i.e., eat more chocolate. And you think about the people who write those messages, do they really believe in those messages, that it is good for you to eat more chocolate? Or they just want to make money off of sparking your desires, taking advantage of your greed, aversion, and delusion. And actually look at the activity of feeding, and it's pretty dismaying. You yourself are put to difficulties in order to get the food, and the food is never totally reliable. In other words, there's no guarantee of an infinite food source. And your life is limited by where you find your food. Many of the times when I've been felt, felt the desire to just wander off into the wilderness, especially when you go to some place that's really beautiful, say like Zion Canyon. You like to wander off into the side canyons and you're always pulled by that, back by the fact that you need food in order to survive. As a ranger there once said, you can't eat the scenery. And the longer you want to wander, the more food you have to carry around. And then, of course, you think about the things that are being fed on. Even if you have a vegetarian diet, they're the, they're the farmers' 
and other workers that have to get the food from the soil to you. And they all suffer. That's just physical food. And there's mental food, our emotional food. We feed off our relationships, but we know our relationships can't last. We feed off our ideas of ourselves, all the different forms of clinging, sensuality, views, habits and practices, views about who we are. We feed on these things, but they, they keep changing on us. And they never really provide any real sustenance. They just bring more and more suffering. This is why the Buddha said, feed the mind in a different way, a way that gets it so strong that eventually you don't have to feed anymore. The five strengths, conviction, persistence, mindfulness, concentration, discernment, these are healthy food for the mind, food that teaches it to be more and more independent, less and less reliant on its old kinds of feeding, its old kinds of food. And when you think of the image of feeding, that it's not just you gobbling down stuff, but you're also on fire. It makes it more and more imperative that you really want to develop these kinds of food, and you really want to give your life to this practice. Try to live your life in a way that you minimize the, the duties and the entanglements you take on. And although we all do have our responsibilities, we want to wear them as lightly as possible. And John Fuhrman once said, there's the internal Wat and the external Wat. Wat in Thai has two meanings. It means monastery, but also means your, your duties. And he says there are times when you have to make the choice. You're going to follow the external ones or the internal ones. And he says always give priority to the internal ones. As for the external ones, you know that the world outside is never going to be perfect. So you do them in a way that develops more energy, that develops your, your tendency, your habit for being energetic and for being responsible in your actions. But if you find that the external ones are sapping your strength for your internal duties, then you've got to drop them. Realize the limitations of what we can take on outside. So remember, you've got to keep your priorities clear. You've got to be earnest in your practice. We're not doing this in an ironic way. We're not doing this in a playing at it kind of way. And John Lee has a good talk about people who simply play at the practice. He says they're like monkeys who put on monkeys that are dressed up to put on a monkey show, but it's still just a monkey show, no matter how fancy the dress. It's a pretty harsh image. I remember the story that the Buddha tells about those former Brahmas that come down as the world is beginning to evolve. They leave the Brahma world, and they're radiant. They float over the face of the waters, feeding on rapture. And then they begin to notice there's this film developing on the water. It has the color of ghee. And one of them, in a careless moment, says, what's this like? And he tastes it. It tastes like pure wild honey. 
so he starts falling on you, smitten with a taste. And the other Brahmas see that, and so they try too, and they like it too, and they start fighting over the, the ghee. And as they do that, they lose their self-luminosity, they no longer have the rapture they had before. The sun and the moon appear, and the world begins to develop in a negative way, all because of their carelessness. And so, wouldn't this be fun? Wouldn't that be fun? There are people who complain that if you're really serious about the practice, you use your spont lose your spontaneity. Well, spontaneity may have its good side, but it has its bad side as well. You want to be really careful. You have to be heedful. Your actions do have consequences. You can't pretend that they don't. And as for the pleasure in the practice, the Buddha says it's, it's loaded there on the practice of right concentration. If you want to find joy and spontaneity, look there. As for their actions, you have to be very careful to be restrained. Otherwise, you end up doing and saying and thinking things that you later regret, and that regret is very hard to get rid of, especially as life goes on and you don't see any progress coming in your practice. You begin to wonder, what's this all about? What have I been doing? Don't be the sort of person who realizes that a lot of time was wasted, a lot of time was thrown away. Because we don't have an infinite amount of time. The conditions here may not be perfect, but they're good for the practice. You want to take advantage of them while you have them. And be earnest in the practice, because after all, suffering is earnest too. It's not just playing around. As John Mahabu once said of a John Mun, he looked at him and he knew immediately he was an earnest person, the sort of person who could scare away his defilements just through his earnestness. Because that's the only way you're going to get past them.